Chapter One of the Artspan Tales of South Africa by J. Percy Fitzpatrick. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Read by Sally McConnell in Betty's Bay, South Africa, in May 2010. The Artspan Chapter One The Artspan there is no art in the telling that can equal the consummate art of the happening. It was a remark dropped by a forgotten someone in a prospectus hut one night, years and years ago, when we had exhausted snakes and hunting, lucky strikes and escapes, and had got away into coincidences. One of the party had been telling us an experience of his. He was introduced on the day he arrived to a man well known on the fields. It seemed quite impossible that they could have met before, for they compared dates and places for ten years back, and yet both were puzzled by the hazy suggestion of having seen the other before, and, in our friend's case, of something more definite. His remark to the other was, "'I can't help feeling that I saw you once in a devil of a fright somewhere.' or dreamt it, I suppose. But this first feeling faded quickly away, and was utterly forgotten by both. Later on they shared a hut near Rymer's Creek, and afterwards, when houses came into vogue, they lived for several years together, while the first impression was lying buried, but not dead. One day, in the process of swapping yarns, the other man was telling of the narrowest escape he ever had, and all due to such a simple little mistake. A ticket collector took the tickets at the wrong end of a footbridge. Instead of collecting them as the passengers from the train went onto the bridge, he took them as they were going off. The result was that the crowd of exertionists was too great for the little bridge, and it slipped between the abutments carrying some two hundred people into the river below, the narrator being one of them. It was then that the dormant idea stirred and awoke, jumped into life, and our friend put up his hands, as he had done fifteen years before when the little bridge in Bath dropped, and gasped out, "'My God! You were the other chap that hung on to the broken rail. That's where we met!' That was what prompted the forgotten one to say after we had lapsed into silence, There is no art in the telling that can equal the consummate art of the happening. And I only recall the remark because it must be my apology for telling plain truth, just as it happened. When a man has spent some years of his life, the years of young manhood they generally are, in the felt, in the wagon or tent, or bush, it is an almost invariable rule that something which you can't define germinates in him, and never entirely dies until he does. When this thing, this instinct, feeling, craving, call it what you will, awakens as it periodically does, it becomes a madness, and they call it trek fever. And then, as an old friend used to say, you must trek or burst. There are many stories based on trek fever, but this is not one of them. And if you were to ask those who know them, or, better still, get hold of any of the old hands, hard-headed, commonplace, unromantic specimens though they might be, who live in the felt, if you give them time to let it slip out unawares, you would find that every man-jack of them would have something to say about the campfire. I do believe that the fascination within the fascination is the campfire in felt life, with its pleasant yarn swapping and its long, pregnant, thoughtful silences no less enjoyable. The least loquacious individual in the world will be tempted to unfold a tale within the circle of a campfire's light. Everything is so quietly, unobtrusively sociable, and subjects are not too numerous in the felt so that when a man has something apropos or interesting to tell, he commands an appreciative audience. Nobody bores, and nobody interrupts. 
Perhaps it is the half-lazy preference for playing the listener, which every one feels that is the best security against bores and interruptions. The charm of the life is indescribable, and none who have tasted it ever weary of it, ever forget it, or cease to feel the longing to return when once they have quitted it. It was in 91, the year after the pioneers cut their way through the bush with Sulu to guide them, and occupied Mishonaland. We followed their trail and lived again their anxious nights and days, when they, a small handful in a dense bush, at the mercy of the Matabele thousands, did not know at what hour they would be pounced on and massacred. We crossed the Lundi, and somewhere beyond, where one of their worst nights was passed, we outspanned in peace and security, and gossiped over the ruins of ancient temples and the graves of modern pioneers. There were half a dozen of us, and we lay round the fire in lazy silence, too content to speak, simply living, and drinking in the indescribable glories of an ideal African night. It was someone knocking his pipe out and asking for the tobacco that broke the long silence, and the old Barbertonian, who had had to move to release the tobacco, looked round with the air of wanting someone to talk to. As no one gave any sign, he asked presently, "'Are you chaps asleep?' "'No,' came in clear, wakeful voices with various degrees of promptness. "'I was just thinking,' he said, refilling his pipe slowly, "'that this sort of thing, a night like this, you know, and all that, although it seems perfection to us, isn't really so perfect after all. It all depends on the point of view, you know. A night like this must be a perfect curse to a lion or a tiger, you know. Your sympathies are too wide, old man, said the surveyor. Chuck me a light, and console yourself that your predatory friends do well enough when others are miserable. Take a more human view. If you want an outlet for your native sympathy, you might heave me out a cushion, suggested another. I've made a pillow of a bucket and got a dent in my head. The thick cushion, old boy. And I'm with you so far as to say that the lions have a jolly hard time of it with so much fine weather. The Barbertonian lighted his pipe and threw the cushion at the last speaker. Hmph, he grunted between puffs. I was really thinking of it from quite a human standpoint. The view of that poor devil who got lost here two months ago. Now, he couldn't have thought much of nights like these. Do you think he mused on their beauty? Oh, I heard something of him, said one. Lost for forty days in the wilderness, wasn't he, I remember? The coincidence struck me as peculiar. Yes, it was odd in a way. He was just forty days and forty nights. He went out with a rifle and five cartridges to kick up a diker along the river bank here, and somehow or other got astray toward sundown and lost his head completely. Five cartridges, seven matches, no grub, no coat, no compass, and no savvy. That's a fair start for a forty days picnic, isn't it? he resumed. Well, he fired off all his cartridges by dark, trying to signal to his camp, and then threw away his rifle. Fact! He broke the heads off two matches, he was so shaking from fright, before he realised that there were only seven altogether. But as he had nothing to cook, it didn't really make much difference whether he had matches or not. What? In winter time And with lions about? Yeah, well, you get used to that. It was a bit frosty and sometimes wet, and at first the lions worried him a lot and treed him several nights. But he says that was nothing, while the sense of being lost, dead yet alive, remained. What's that? Live? Oh, he doesn't know himself how he lived, but we could pretty well tell by his condition when we found him. We were out shooting about five miles downstream, and on one of the sandy spits of the river we saw fresh footprints. 
nigger, we thought, as it was barefoot. We wondered because there were no kraals near here, and we had seen no cattle spoor or footpaths. I was on top of the bank every minute expecting a diker or bushback to make a break out, and, I tell you, I don't know when I got such a start, such a turn, I should say, as when I caught sight of a white face looking at me out of an ant-bear hole. Great Caesar! There was something so infernally uncanny, wild, and hunted in the look that I instinctively got the gun round to cover him if he came at me. When the others came up, he crawled out, stark naked, sunburnt, scratched, shock-headed, still staring with that strange, hunted look, came up to us and laughed. We led him back to our camp. He could tell nothing, could hardly understand any of our questions. He was quite dazed. His hands were cut and disfigured. The nails were torn off with burrowing for roots. We went to his den. It was a big ant-bear hole under an old tree and among rocks, a well-chosen spot. He had burrowed it out a bit, I think, and in a sort of pigeon-hole or socket in the side of it there were a few nuts, and round about were the remains of nuts and chewed roots, stones of fruit and such things. I never could understand how it was that, being mad as he certainly was then, he still had the sense, well, really it was an instinct more than any knowledge, to get roots and wild fruits to keep body and soul together. A suggestive subject, truly, said a man who had more millions to his credit than you would expect of a traveller in Mishonaland. A man starving within rifle shot of his friends and supplies, helpless in spite of the resources that civilization gives him, and saved from absolute death by a blessed instinct that we didn't know was ours since the days of the anthropomorphic ape. Hmm, you're right, Barberton. He couldn't have thought much of the beauties of the night, and if he thought at all, he must have placed a grim and literal interpretation on the descent of man when he was grubbing for roots with bleeding nail-stripped fingers, or climbing for nuts without a tail to steady him. Among us there was a retired naval man, a clean-featured, bronzed, shrewd-looking fellow, who was a determined listener during these campfire chats. In fact, he seldom made a remark at all. He sat cross-legged, with one eye closed, a telescope habit, I suppose, watching Barberton for quite a spell, and at last said very slowly, and seemingly speaking under compulsion, Well, you never know how they take these shocks. We picked a man up once, whose two companions had laid dead beside him for days and days. Before he became delirious, the last thing he remembers was getting some carbolic acid from a small medicine chest. His mates had been dead two days then, and he had not the strength to heave them overboard. I believe he wanted to drink the carbolic. Anyway, he spilt it, and went off his head with the smell of the carbolic around him. He recovered while with us. We were on a wary deep-sea sounding cruise, but twice during the voyage he had short but violent returns of the delirium and the other condition that he was suffering under when we found him. By the merest accident, our doctor discovered that it was the smell of carbolic that had sent him off. Once, years after this, he nearly died of it. He had had fever, and they kept disinfecting his room. But luckily for him, he became dangerous and violent, and they had to remove him to another place. He was all right in a few days. Do you believe that a man could live out a reasonably long lifetime in the way that forty days chap lived? I suppose he could, eh? Sure. Fancy forgetting the civilised uses of tongue and limbs and brain. It seems awful, doesn't it? And yet men have been known to deliberately choose a life of savagery and barbarism. Men whose lines had been cast in easy places, too. That's all very well, said Barberton. Now you are speaking of fellows settling down among savages and in the wilds voluntarily, and with certain provisions made for emergencies, etc., not of men lost. Even so, a man must deteriorate most horribly under such circumstances. Well, said Barberton contemplatively, I don't know so much about that. 
It all depends on the man. Mind you, I do think that the end is always fiasco, tragedy, trouble, ruin, call it what you like. We can't throw back to barbarism at will. For good or ill, we have taken civilization, and the man who quits it pays heavy toll on the road he travels, and likely enough fetches up where he never expected to. The man who wrote for the papers smiled. I know, he said with a kindling eye, I know. It was just such a case you told us of at Churchill's camp the other night. A man of the best calibre and training goes wild and marries two, mark you, two Kaffir women, and becomes a Swazi chief. And then the drama of the drama be damned, growled Barberton. It was one case out of twenty of the same sort. Barberton was nervously apprehensive of ridicule and hated to be traded and walked out for effects. I was up on the Transvaal Swazi border in 86, said the millionaire. I remember you told me something of them then. It was a warm corner, Swaziland, then. Almost the warmest in South Africa, I should think, eh? You're right, it was. But, said Barberton, turning to the correspondent, you were talking of men going amuck through playing white nigger. Well, I can tell you this, that two of my best friends have done that same trick, and I'd stake my head that better men or more thorough gentlemen never trod in shoe leather for all their kaffir ways. Do you mean to say, asked the millionaire, that you have known men settle down among natives, living among them as one of themselves, and still retain the manners, customs, instincts, habits of mind and body, even to the ambitions, of a white man? No, well, I can't say that. Their ambitions, as far as you could gauge them, were a Kaffir's. That is, they aspired to own cattle and to hunt successfully. But, and yet I don't know that it is right to say that even, because in almost every case these men get the hanker for white life again sooner or later. The Kaffir ambition may be a temporary one, or it may be that the return to white ways is the passing mania. Who knows, anyway? From my own experience of them, I can say that the return to their own colour almost invariably means their doom and ruin. I don't know why, but I've noticed it, and it seems like, like a sort of judgment, if you believe in those things. And, you know, he said, after taking a few pulls at the pipe again, there's a sense of justice in that too. Civilization, scorned and flouted, being the instrument of its own revenge. If one could vest the abstract with personal feelings, what an ample revenge would be hers at the sight of the renegade, sick-hearted, weary and shamefaced, coming back to the ways of his youth and race, and succumbing to some part of that which he had despised and rejected in toto. Barberton usually became philosophic and reminiscent on these fine nights. Someone would make a remark of pretty general application, and he would sit up and wag his old head a few times in silence. Then, from force of habit, examine his pipe and knock it out on the heel of his boot, and then out would lounge some reminiscence in illustration of his philosophy. It was generally introduced by a long-drawn, thoughtful, well, you know, I've always thought there was something curious about these things. He would have another squint down the empty bowl of the pipe and ask for the tobacco. There would be a couple of grunts, and then, as he lighted up, he would say between puffs, I remember, in 78, up at Pilgrim's, or there was a fellow up Barberton Way in 86. This night he sat in tailor fashion with an elbow socketed in each knee-bend, and his hands clasped over the bowl of his pipe. "'One of the rummiest meetings I ever had,' said he, smiling thoughtfully at the recollection, "'was in the Swazi country in eighty-five. "'Did I ever tell you about Mahash and the Silver Spur?' <laughs> he gave a gurgling sort of chuckle, and puffed contentedly at the big, bold briar. There were two of us riding through the Swazi country, and making for the landing-place on the Maputa side. We had had a row with the Portuguese about some cattle that the niggers stole from us, 
A couple of the niggers got shot, of course, during the discussion, and we had to quit for a while and take a rest on the Lebombo. But that's nix. When we got to the Kamati, we were told that there was a white man on the Lebombo whose Kaffir name was Sebogwan. That's the name the niggers gave to a man who wears an eyeglass or spectacles. We were jogging along, doing our thirty miles a day, living on old mealies roasted on a bit of tin, and an occasional fowl, swazi fowl, two to the meal, helped down by bowls of amas, thick milk, you know. We used to sleep out in the bush every night with a blanket apiece and saddles for pillows, and the horses picketed at our heads. Man, it was grand on nights like this. We were always tired and often hungry, but to lie there in the peace and stillness of the bush, to look up at the stars like diamond dust against the sky, and not care a damn for anything in God's world, why, why I call that living. All those months we had no knowledge of the outer world. As far as we were concerned, there might as well have been none. We had one book, the Ingoldsby Legends. If anyone could have seen me reading Ingoldsby by the light of the fire, and have heard every now and then the bursts of laughter over the jackdaw of Reims, or the witch's frolic and others, his face would have been a study, I expect. However, I was telling you about Mahash. Mahash was a big Induna, and had about five to seven thousand fighting men. He used to conza to Umbandine, but paid merely nominal tribute, and was jolly independent. He was the cleverest-looking nigger I have ever seen small, thin and ascetic-looking, with wonderfully delicate hands, clear features and lustrous black eyes. Really, he gave one the idea that he saw through everything, or next to it, and though he said very little, he looked one of the very determined, quiet ones. We had to pass his place to get to Sebogwan's, and of course had to stay the day and pay our respects. His kraal was on top of the highest plateau near the Mananga Bluff. It lay on the edge of a forest, and the road— an aggregation of cattle tracks, was very steep and very stony. You can imagine we were not over flush just then, and what puzzled us was what to give the chief as a present when he would accord us an interview. Rifles and ammunition we daren't part with, and we were mortally afraid they were just the things he would want to annex. Finally it occurred to us to present him with one of my chum's silver spurs. Heron didn't favour this much, he said it would likely cause trouble, but I put that down to his disinclination to spoil his pair of swagger spurs. Only the day before our arrival the chief had purchased a horse. He had sent to Leidenburg for it, and it was the first they had ever seen in that part of the country. Which seems odd when you think that the chief's own name, Mahash, means the horse. However, to proceed, we got word the next day that the chief would see us, and after the usual hour's wait we had our endaba and presented the silver spur. I must say he viewed it very suspiciously, very, and when we showed him how to put it on, he gave a slow, cynical smile, and made some remark in an undertone to one of his counsellors. I began to agree with Heron about the unwisdom of giving a present so little understood, and would gladly have changed it, but that Mahash, who was of a practical turn of mind, sent a man for our horses and bade us ride with the biting iron on. We gave an exhibition of its uses which pleased him, and we too felt quite satisfied for a moment. But things didn't look quite so well when he announced that he was going to ride his horse, and he desired Heron to strap the spur on to his bare foot. It was no use hesitating. We had to trust to luck and the chances that a skinny moke such as his was would take no notice of a spur. Besides which Heron, with good presence of mind, jammed the rowels on a stone and turned most of the points. It was no good, however. The chief had never been astride a horse before. He was hoisted up by a couple of stalwart warriors. Once on, he laid hold of the men with both hands and gripped his heels firmly under the horse's belly. I saw the brute's ears go flat on his neck. The two supporters stepped back. Mahash swayed to one side, and I suppose gave a convulsive grip with the armoured heel. There was a squeal and a scuffle, and a black streak shooting through the air with a red blanket floating behind it. The chief once bounced on the stony incline, 
shot on for another ten feet, and fetched up with his head against a rock. I can tell you that for two minutes it was just hell let loose. We dropped our rifles, we always carried them, and ran to the chief. I believe if we had kept them they'd have struck us, for there were scores of black devils round us, flashing assegais in our faces and yelling, Polalilangos! Umtagati! Umtagati! They have killed the chief. Witchcraft! Witchcraft! But in another minute we saw Mahash standing propped up by several cashlers and holding one hand to his head. He steadied himself for a moment, gave us one steady, inscrutable look, and walked into his private enclosure. For four days we remained there, prisoners in fact, though not in name. Nothing was said about leaving, but our guns and horses were gone, and we were given a hut to ourselves in the centre of the kraal. We didn't know whether Mahash was dead, dying, or quite unhurt. We didn't know whether we were to be dispatched or set free, or to be kept for ever. On the morning of the fifth day we found our horses tied to the cattle kraal in front of our hut, and a grey-headed Induna brought word to us that Sebogwan, for whom we were looking, lived not far from there along the plateau. We took the hint and saddled up. As we were starting, an Umfan brought a kid, killed and cleaned and handed it to me, a gift from the chief, and the old Induna stepped up to Heron with a queer look in his wrinkled, cunning old fizz, and said, The chief says, Hamvagatle, pleasant journey, and sends you this. It was the silver spur. Barberton had another squint at his pipe and chuckled at the recollection of the old nigger's grim pleasantry. But I was telling you about that white man on the bomba, he resumed. We weren't long in making tracks out of Mahasha's kraal, and as we dodged along through the forest, following a footpath which just permitted a man on foot to pass, we realised how poor a chance we'd have had had we tried to escape. Every hundred yards or so we had to dismount to get under overhanging boughs or trunks of fallen trees or networks of monkey ropes. The horses had got so used to roughing it that they went like cats, and in several places they had to duck under the heavy timber that hung portcullis fashion across the dark little pathway. This was the only way out at the back of Mahasha's. In front of him, of course, were the precipitous sides of the Le Bombo range. We went on for hours through this sort of thing, hardly seeing sunlight through the dense foliage, and when we got out at last into a green grassy flat, the bright light and open country fairly dazzled us. Here we met a few women and boys, who, in reply to our stock question, gave the same old reply that we had heard for days, Sebogwan, oh, feather on ahead. We just swore together like one man, for we really had reckoned to get to this flying Dutchman this time without further disappointments. We looked around for a place to off-saddle and made for a copy surrounded by trees. Heron was ahead. As we reached the trees he pulled up, and with a growing grin called to me, I say, just look here, here's a rum start. It was clearly our friend Sebogwan. He was standing with arms akimbo and feet well set apart, surveying critically the framework of a house he was putting up. He had a towel round his loins, and an eyeglass screwed tightly into the near eye. Nothing else. We viewed him on profile for quite a while, until he turned sharply our way and saw us. It was one of the pleasantest faces in the world that smiled on us then. Sebogwan walked briskly towards us, saying, Welcome, gentlemen, welcome. It's not often I see a white face here, and, by the by, you'll excuse my attire, won't you? The custom of the country, you know, and in Rome, well, well, you'll off saddle, of course, and have a snack. Here, Kamala, Bovan, hi, you guys, where the devil are they? Here, take these two horses and feed them, and now just walk into my parlour. Nothing ominous in the quotation, I assure you. He bustled us around in the jolliest manner possible, and kept up a running fire of questions, answers, comments, and explanations, while he busied himself with our comfort. It was a round, wattle and daub hut that he showed us into, but not the ordinary sort. This one was as bright and clean as a new pin. Bits of calico and muslin and gay-coloured capellan made curtains, blinds, and table covers. 
The tables were of the gin case pattern, legs planted in the ground. The chairs, ordinary bush stools. But what struck me as so extraordinary was the sight of all the English periodicals and illustrated papers laid out in perfect order and neatness on the table, as one sees them arranged in a reading room before the first frequenters have disturbed them. There was also a little hanging shelf on which were five books. I couldn't help smiling at them. The Bible, a Shakespeare, the Navy List, a Dictionary, and Rough's Guide. They say that you may tell a man by his friends, and most of all by his books, but I couldn't make out much of this lot, with one exception. I looked at the chap's easy bearing, the pleasant hearty manner, and torpedo beard, and concluded that the Navy List at any rate was a bit of evidence. However, he kept things going so pleasantly and gaily that one had no time in which to observe much. Lots of little things occurred which were striking and amusing in a way, because of the particular surroundings and conditions of the man's life, rather than because of the incidents themselves. For instance, when we owned up that we had had no breakfast, we found ourselves within a few minutes enjoying poached eggs on toast, and I felt myself grinning all over when the Swazi boy waited in passable style with a napkin thrown carelessly over one shoulder. Surely a man must be a bit eccentric to live such a life as this, in such a place and alone, and yet take the trouble to school a nigger to wait on him in conventional style. I thought of the peculiar littleness of teaching a nigger boy that waiter's trick, and concluded that our friend, whatever his occupation might be, was not a trader from necessity. After breakfast he produced some excellent cigarettes, another fact in the nature of a paradox. We were making for the landing place on the Tembe River, and had intended moving along again that day, but our host was pressing, and we by no means anxious to turn our backs on so pleasant a camp, so we stayed overnight and became good friends right away. I was quite right. He had been in the Navy many years, and had given it up to play at exploring. He said he had settled down here because there was absolute peace and a blissful immunity from the ordinary worldly worries. Once a week a native runner brought him his mail letters and papers, and in fact, as he said, he was as near to the world as he chose to be, or as far from it. He had a curious gold charm attached to a watch-chain, which I saw dangling from a projecting wattle-end in the dining-hut. I was looking at this and puzzling over it. It seemed so unlike anything I had ever seen. He saw me, and after putting us to many a futile guess, told us laughingly that he had found it in one of the villages they had sacked on the west coast. I don't know what sort of part he took in these nasty little wars, but I'll bet it was no mean one. We listened that night for hours to his easy, bright, entertaining chat, and although he hardly ever mentioned himself or his own doings, one couldn't but see that he had been well in the thick of things, and dearly loved to be where the danger was. Now and then he let slip a reference to hardships, escapes, and dangers, but only when such reference was necessary to explain something he was telling us of. What interested us most was his description of General Gordon, Chinese Gordon, with whom he appeared to have been in close contact for a good while. The little details he gave us made up an extraordinarily vivid picture of the soldier saint, the man who could lead a storming party, a forlorn hope, with a Bible in one hand and a cane in the other, the man who, in the infiniteness of his love and tenderness, and in the awful immutability of his decision and justice, realised qualities in a degree which we only associate with the deity. I felt I could see this man helping, feeding with his own short rations, nursing and praying with the lowliest of his men, the incarnation of mercy. But I also saw him facing the semi-mutinous regiment of barbarians, and with the awful passionless decision of fate itself, singling out the leaders here and there, in all a dozen men, whom he shot dead before their comrades, and turning again as calm and as unmoved as ever to repeat his order, which this time was obeyed. I pictured this man, with the splendid practical genius to reconquer and reorganize China, treasuring a cutting which he had taken from what he verily believed to be the identical living tree from which Eve had plucked the forbidden fruit, surely one of the enigmas of history. "'Do you mean to say that's a fact?' asked the millionaire as old Barberton paused. 
As far as I know, it certainly is. Our friend told it as a fact, and not in ridicule either, for he had the deepest reverence and regard for Gordon. He assured us, moreover, that Gordon was once most deeply mortified and offended by a colleague of his treating the matter as a joke and laughing at it. Gordon never forgot that laugh, and was always constrained and reserved in the man's presence afterwards. I wish I could remember a hundredth part of our host's anecdotes of well-known people, descriptions of places and of peoples, accounts of travels and adventures. He seemed to know everyone and all places. It was three in the morning before we thought of turning in. After breakfast we saddled up and bade adieu, but our friend walked along part of the way with us to put us on the right path. He was carrying a bunch of white bush flowers, a curious fancy, I thought, for a man clothed in a towel and an eyeglass. I remarked on the beauty of the mountain flowers, and he held up the bunch. Yes, he said, they are lovely, aren't they? Poor old Terry. He was my man, the only other white man that ever lived here. He was with me for many years, and died here two summers back, fever contracted on the Tembe. Poor old fellow. I fixed him up on the bluff yonder. He used to gather these flowers and sit there every day of his life, looking out towards Delagoa, wondering if he would ever quit this place and get a sight of old Ireland again. I take him a bunch once in a while. Come up and see where a good friend lies. We left the horses and climbed up the rough path, and looked at the unpretentious stone enclosure and the soft slate slab with a rough-cut inscription. Paddy Tarry's Rest. Are you ready? Aye, aye, sir. Our friend leaned over the low stone wall, and replaced the faded wreath by the fresh one. We left him standing there on the ridge, clear cut above the outline of the mountain, and took our way down the rough cattle path that wound down to the still rougher, wilder kloof through which our route lay. I remember so well the way he was standing, one foot on the projecting rock, arms folded, until we were rounding the turn that took us out of sight. Then he waved adieu. We had unpleasant times on that trip to the Tembe. We met all the murderous ruffians in that Alsatia, and they were all at loggerheads, thieving and shooting with both hands. However, we got out all right after months and months of roaming about, owing to the trouble about those Kaffirs, and I think we had both forgotten all about Seboguan by the time we fetched up in Leidenburg again. There was always something happening in that infernal outlaw corner of Swaziland to keep the time from dragging. My chum went off to his farm, but I had no home, and took the road again with wagons, and loaded for Barberton at slashing fine rates. I got there just as the Sheba boom was on. Companies were being floated daily, shares were booming, money flowing freely. All were merry in the sunshine of today, no one took heed of tomorrow. Speculators were making money in heaps, brokers raking in thousands. You know how it is in a place like that. After you have been there for a few hours, or a day or two, you begin to notice that one name is always cropping up oftener than any other. One man seems the most popular, important, and indispensable. Well, it was the same here. There was always this one name in everything, market, mines, sport, entertainment, any blessed department. You can just imagine, at least you can't imagine, my surprise when I found that my naked white Kaffir sailor friend, Seboguan, was the man of the hour. I couldn't believe it at first, and then a while later it seemed to be the most natural thing in the world, for if I ever met a man who looked the living embodiment of mental, moral, and physical strength, of good humour, grace, and frankness, a born king among men, it was this chap. I met him next day and he seemed more full of life and personal magnetism than ever. After that I didn't see him for three or four days. You know how time spins away in a wild, booming market. Then somebody said he was ill, down with dysentery and fever at the Phoenix. I went off at once to see him. I couldn't believe my eyes. He was emaciated, haggard, with black-ringed eyes sunk into his head, and so weak that he couldn't raise his arm when it slipped from the bed. He spoke to me in whispers and gasps, only a word or two, and then lay back on the pillows with a terrible look of suffering in his eyes, or occasionally dropping the lids with peculiar suddenness. And when he did this, 
the room seemed empty from loss of this horrible expression of pain. I stood at the foot of the bed and didn't know what to do or say, and didn't know how to get out of a room where I was so useless. This sort of thing may only have lasted a few minutes, or perhaps half an hour, I don't know. But after one long spell he opened his eyes suddenly and looked long and steadily into mine, sat bolt upright, apparently without effort, lifted his glance till I felt he was looking over my head at something on the wall behind me, and then raised both arms, outstretched as though to receive something, and groaning out, Oh, my God, my poor wife, dropped back dead. There were five intent faces upturned at Barberton as he stopped. The rosy glow of the fire lighted them up, and the man nearest me, the millionaire, whispered to himself, Good God! How awful! Well, who was he? Did you... began the man who wrote for the papers. Barberton looked steadily at him, and with measured deliberation said, We never knew another word about him. From that day to this nothing has ever been heard to throw the least light on him or what he said. Far away in the stillness of the African night we heard the impatient half-grunt, half-groan of the lion. Nearby there was a cricket chirping, and presently a couple of the logs settled down with a small crunch, and a fresh tongue of flame leapt up. Barberton pumped a straw up and down the stem of the faithful briar, and remarked sententiously, "'Yeah, it's a rum old world, this of ours. I've seen civilization take its revenge that way quite a lot of times, just like a woman.' No one else said a word. Now and then a snore came from under the wagon where the drivers were sleeping. The dog beside me gave some abortive whimpers, and his feet twitched convulsively. No doubt he was hunting in dreamland. I felt depressed by Barberton's yarn. But round the campfire long silences do not generally follow a yarn, however often they precede one. One reminiscence suggests another, and it takes very, very little to tempt another man to recall something which that just reminds me of. It was the surveyor who rose to it this time. I could see the spirit move him. He sat up, stroked his clean-shaven face, closed the telescope eye, and looked at Barberton. Do you know, he began thoughtfully, you talk of chaps going away because of something happening, some quarrel or mistake or offence or something. That is all a sort of claptrap romance. I know, the mystery trick, and so forth. But I confess it always interests me, although I know it's all rot, because of a thing which happened within my own knowledge, an affair of a shipmate of mine, one of the best fellows that ever stepped the earth, in spite of the fact that he was a regular Admiral Crichton. He was an ideal sort of chap, until you got to know him really well, and found out that he was cursed with one perfectly miserable tray. He never, absolutely never, forgave an injury, a front, or cause of quarrel. He was not huffy or bad-tempered. A sunnier nature never was created. A more patient, even-tempered chap never lived. But it was really appalling with what immutable obstinacy he refused to forgive. In the instances that came under my own notice, where he had quarrelled with former friends, not through his own fault, I must say, nothing in this world, or any other for that matter, could influence him to shake hands or renew acquaintance. His generosity and unselfishness were literally boundless, his courage and fidelity superb, but any one who had seen evidence of his fault must have felt sorrow and regret for the blemished nature, and must have been awestruck and frightened by his relentlessness. Death all around him, the sight of it in friends, the prospect of it for himself, never shook his cursed obstinacy, as we knew after one piece of business. He got the VC for a remarkable in fact, mad act of courage in rescuing a brother officer. The man he carried out, fought for, fought over, and nearly died for, was a man to whom he had not spoken for some years. God knows what the difference was about. This was their first meeting since quitting the same ship, and when he carried his former friend out and laid him safely in the surgeon's corner of the square, the half-dead man caught his sleeve and called out, "'God bless you, old boy!' All he did was to loosen the other's grip gently, and without a word or look at him, walk back into the fight. It seems incredible, it did to us, but he wouldn't know him again. He had literally wiped him out of his life. This tray was his curse. 
He was well off and well connected, and he married one of the most charming women I have ever met. For years none of us knew he was married. His wife was, I am convinced, as good as gold, but she was young, attractive, accomplished, and in fact a born conqueror. Perhaps she was foolish to show all the happiness she felt in being liked and admired. You know the long absences of a sailor. Well, perhaps she would have been wiser had she cut society altogether, but she was a true good woman for all that, and she worshipped him like a god. None of us ever knew what happened, but he left wife and child, settled on them all he had in the world, handed over his estates and almost all his income and his right to legacies to come, went out into the world and simply erased them from his mind and life. That was a good many years ago. Ten, I should think. And I hate to think it, but I wish I was as sure of tomorrow as I am sure that he never recognised their existence again. The surveyor shuddered at the thought. He was a man who could do anything that other men could do. He was best at everything. He was loved by his mates, worshipped by his men, and liked and admired by everyone who met him, until this tray was revealed. Others must have felt as I did. When I discovered that in him, I don't know whether I was more frightened or grieved. I don't know that I didn't stick to him more than ever, perhaps from pity and the sense that he was his own enemy and needed help. I have never heard of or from him since he left the service, and yet I believe I was his most intimate friend. Oliver Raymond Rivers was his name. Musical name, isn't it? Barberton dropped his pipe. Good God! Sebo Guan! End of chapter 1